Welcome to the E-Commerce Optimizer Show. I'm your host, Scott Reed. This episode is brought to you by E-Commerce Optimizers. We specialize in helping e-commerce brands in one focused area, and that's making your website easier to use so that more of your visitors buy from you. Now, an easy-to-use website delivers a highly intuitive, straightforward, and smooth experience throughout the customer journey, making it much easier and more enjoyable to do business with you. Now, this translates into a wide variety of business-building benefits, including increased revenue, higher profits, and happier, loyal customers who buy from you time and time again. Now, if you'd like to learn more about how we make e-commerce sites easier to use and how our services might benefit your business, head on over to our website at ecommerceoptimizers.com and check out all the details. All right, so on today's show, we have two guests, actually. This is the first episode that we have two guests, and they're actually brothers. We have David Sasson and Amitai Sasson, and they are with overstockart.com, but they're also with a SaaS product that's called Communicator Base. And so last week, Amitai and, and, and I, we had a, a great conversation, and uh, it, it really made sense to to invite them onto the podcast because I, I figured that, um, well, I didn't figure, I knew it was going to be a, a fantastic episode due to the level of experience that they have in all things e-commerce, SaaS. We're going to talk about the theory of constraints, which many listeners may not know about, but it, it was pioneered by a guy by the name of Dr. Elihu Goldratt, who was a professor at the University of Tel Aviv. The book he published was called The Goal back in 1984. So this is a 40-year anniversary of The Goal. And I think it's, in my opinion, I read it probably, I don't know, 25 years ago. And I think it's one of the best business books ever written. So without any further ado, thank you very much for coming on the show, David and Amitai. I really appreciate it. And why don't we just start out with some quick introductions. Sure. Yeah. So, well, first of all, thank you very much for having us. Um, I'm David Sasson with OverstockArt.com. And... Oh, yeah. My name is Amitai. <laughs> Amitai Sasson. I'm with OverstockArt.com as well. Uh, uh, I just wanted to say that that book, The Goal, Ilya Goldratt's book, I went to school in Tel Aviv University, and it's a required book to read there. Uh uh, Professor Goldratt was uh, that's his alma mater is uh, Tel Aviv University, and I had the pleasure to do my MBA there. And probably the one, uh, the biggest takeaway from that uh, MBA was uh, the course of value creation that was done by Eliyahu Goldratt's disciples at the time. And uh, just getting to know the theory of constraint was probably the biggest take for me from that period. Um, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks for that. Thanks for that background, guys. Why don't we Why don't we start out talking about uh, Overstock Art? D D David, you started e OverstockArt.com back in 2001 with your wife. Could you Could you talk to us about how you started the business, how you came up with the idea, and all that? Just the, where, where did the genesis come from? Or what was sure, the sure. Uh, be happy to. Um, so interestingly enough, I mean, Ty was actually involved from the beginning, uh, even before we started the company. Um, I worked with a lot of companies in the computer industry. We worked with the different dot-coms back then. And um, Amitai ran into some people that dealt with a similar product line. And um, we bought some samples of the of the hand-painted oil paintings that, uh, that are the bread and butter or the main product line that Overstock Art carries to this day. And I remember the first kind of group of paintings that we bought, and I was amazed by the product, even though if I looked at it today, I probably wouldn't have been so impressed. But um, so we saw a product that had a tremendous opportunity. We saw e-commerce as what was back then a new distribution system. And we thought the marriage could be interesting of an old world product with a new distribution system. We can get into the to to get started at a low investment, and so that attracted us to you know small risk, big rewards potential, and so um, we went after it. Um, initially, we started at 2001, and um, 
we started from home. Upstairs was the office and uh downstairs we had an extra room in our basement and that was our our warehouse order fulfillment operation and it was really small. Uh we had our own site and uh we worked with initially ubid.com was uh, uh an online auction that was very strong back then and we started working with them and man we would put an item starting at say fifty dollars and it will just go up to a hundred dollars, a hundred and fifty. Like it was it was just like we would sit there and watch people bidding. It was it oh, was kinda of crazy. And um we did not have the, the ability to frame. Everything was just uh shipped rolled. And uh that's how we started. And we invested the money in building our own website and because we wanted to build a brand. We did not want just to 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 be a vendor. Yeah. Um as uh, you know, as um as we started, we saw that uh this was a really cool product. And I remember giving a gift of this product one time, a, a painting that we thought was really beautiful, to a friend. And a couple of months later, we went and visited her. She she lived a few hours away from us. And we asked her, so how do you like it? Oh, I love it. It's a great painting and all that. And I'm like, but it's not framed. You haven't framed it. She's like, yeah, I haven't gotten to it yet. And so we talked and like, you know, we're not cheating them. We're giving them what we said we're going to give them, maybe even better because of imagery and all that. However, they're not using it. Many people are probably not framing. If they don't frame, they're not going to buy, come back and buy from us. So we have to introduce frames. And in year two of the business, we introduced frames and the business increased three times, I think, because all oh. of a sudden people could actually hang it, buy it and hang it. And that was just uh, kind of a great little thing that happened. Almost, I mean, we didn't know it's going to cause this kind of increase, but it did. You kind of removed their bottleneck, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. We, <laughs> we removed their constraint. That's right. We didn't even know about it, but yeah. Um, interestingly enough, one of the reasons I was so attracted, maybe initially, to the fear of constraints is I had this idea in my head ever since I was in college. That a great way of writing a book about business is to put it inside a story, inside a fable. And when first time when I saw the theory of constraint, I'm like, oh my God, this is, this was my idea. This is so beautiful. He did it way before me. So he was smarter than me by, by, by a lot, but, but that impressed me. So that really attracted me. And, uh, I just love the idea. I, I think that, that the theory itself is just, uh, Right on the nose. It's just it, it it could really impact every every part of your life in, in some ways. So um, why don't we why don't we talk about that? What's your definition of the the theory of constraints, and how did you use it? If we talk about overstock art, how did you use that to improve your profitability, the operational efficiencies of the company overall? So. Um, I don't know that I that I can or should provide a new definition of the theory of constraint, but this is how I look at it. Mm -hmm. When you look at a process, when you look at or you look at a company or you look at a situation, there is something that's stopping you from just exploding in many many cases, just growing, and mm -hmm. and so you identifying this one thing. I usually have a really simple, easy visual explanation that I give for a theory of constraint, and, and that's just if you have a, a, a process that in, in the first step you could do 10 units, in the second step you can do two units, in the third step you can do 20 units, improving the 10 or the 20 will not impact the end result of how many units you produce per hour. Only the two matters. Mm -hmm. So you focus all your attention on the two. And that's just a real easy conceptual way of looking at it. For us, when we started implementing the theory of constraints, we looked at our production operation. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of orders. We didn't feel like we were producing them fast enough. We have a relatively simple process. And so we started looking, how do we improve what slows us down? And at the time, there was a actually taking the painting after it got stretched and it was in the frame 
doing all that process was taking a long time. And so we, we looked at ways to improve that specific thing. Once we figured that out, mm-hmm. we started producing more and then we focused somewhere else. And that's, that was the start of us using it. It's finding ways to do improvements to what slows us down in the okay. physical process of fulfillment. That was the first part. Yeah. On my, on my side, as opposed to, you know, David's talking about the, you know, the operations and when you have a, a constraint that's related to product, a production ca- a constraint. Um, on my side, I hold a technical hat, uh, and I deal with the customer side, the customer facing side of the site, uh, and also uh, back end operations. For the customer facing side, when I was, you know, looking at the theory of constraint, I used that in our CRO processes. We, uh, we initially, back in the day, we were started out as a Yahoo store. Um, mm-hmm. Eventually, we, you know, uh, we grew out of that and we were tired of the host solution. So we built, basically, a custom built a new website uh, towards uh, 2015. And and a new website, you know, websites are written in blood. You know, we uh, we like to say, I mean, things, <laughs> your initial the initial site that you're on is just not, you know, there's a lot of, of things that need to be done to the site in order to improve on it. And we decided to take the theory of constraint and build a CRO methodology around the theory of constraint. And the idea was to do the, basically the uh, drum buffer rope kind of uh, uh, iteration on um, finding the constraint First of all, so first of all, we looked at what's the constraint on our website. Mm-hmm. Um, and we said, okay, we're going to use some statistics that's hard statistics and also quantitative information. And we, we're going to come up with what's our constraint, you know, looking at, at where people are bouncing, um, all sorts of drops in the funnel. Mm-hmm. And at first we, this, we, we saw that the constraint is our, uh, product pages. And so we, we worked on that. And so what we did, again, going with the theory of constraint, we got all the resources of the organization to that constraint. We, we, we stopped doing other projects. We focus on that product page. And that was the focus of, you know, going from a wire framing, you know, UX and then a, a pixel perfect design and then uh, coding it and putting it into place. And then. We uh, looked at the numbers. We looked at the numbers again. We we're trying again to measure throughput and get more, you know, revenue from that. And we saw what essentially what we saw that the throughput didn't go as high as we expected. We did see good improvement in the flow. What happened? The constraint has moved. So we keep moving with the constraint into our focus. So we, you keep doing that cycle of focus. And we did that in CRO. It was very uh, successful for us. We moved the needle there. Uh, for our site, that initial site, and when we were after the CRO process was uh, a jump about 30% in, in uh, conversion rate, which that's we huge. were, yeah, and which is huge. Um, so, yeah, so that's an example where the theory of constraint, the focus on finding the constraint, alleviating that constraint, and understanding the constraint is moved somewhere else, uh, and just keeping and just focusing your entire energy into that one focus. So, yeah. And so, and, and when did you, when did you uh, pick that off on the website, Amitai? Uh, well, we implemented that back in 2018. 2018, we okay. 2018, we did that, uh, that process. We started with the, we started with the product page. Then we looked at the card page. Um, then we saw, then we focused on the checkout and then we focused on the homepage. That was just kind of the journey that it took us on. Um, but eventually we saw this, you know, we saw how the funnel reacts, uh, to the changes in the drop offs. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, and I picked up on a couple of things that you just said. Uh, number one is you're looking at the data, the quantitative data. Were you using Google Analytics data to, to identify the opportunities that, that existed within the site or across the yeah. site? Yeah, at the time, like looking at, yeah, you know, uh, bounce rates and things like that, and also the funnel, drop offs mm-hmm. in the funnel, but also quantitative data. I mean, we ask questions, uh, you know, we use, uh, Hotjar for just asking them a simple question. What made you, you know, wh- what made you almost not complete your purchase today? Right. That was 
the questions that we put at the at the end of the of the uh, of the of the checkout, or if they're about to bounce, and what's you know what's keeping you from buying today, and just trying to understand, getting with that. Sometimes the qualitative data is going to be stronger even than the quant you know than the quantitative one. Uh, from what I've seen, really in in e-commerce, it's it's pretty amazing. You know, if you can listen into your customer service, uh, and and really like like if if there was a better way of flow from customer service to the actual you know. Uh, development and then reality for the customer that would be amazing. Did you do any user testing at all? We we did user test. We did A B testing at the time of Google Optimize. Yep. We ran B testing on those. But in reality, to tell you the truth, A B testing has proven to be for us has has proven to be almost not economical. You know yeah. something about it, especially I think that. Well, even in 2018, 2019, especially now, it seems like customers are much more savvy than they used to be. You know, the beginning of the web where you, you know, you change the color of a button, all of a sudden people are reacting to it. I don't think that moves the needle that much. And what we've seen is that creating these tests a lot of times, you know, takes a lot of energy and a lot of focus. And and then, you know, uh, limit to infinity, you're just, you know, you're, you're converging to the mean there, and you're like, oh my god! I mean, it made all these efforts. So if you're not like a million dollar a month site, it might not be worth your while, to be honest. You know. Yeah, and the thing is that that in order to A/B test with confidence, you have to have enough traffic, and the numbers have to work. Otherwise, yeah. you're just you're still just guessing, you know, or yeah. somewhere yeah. in Amazon, between. Yeah, I mean, Amazon can run a test in 30 minutes, right? You know. It yeah. can do it. I mean, but you're, you're going to run a test for three months. Right. Or, you know, it's, it's not going to, it's yeah. tough. It's tough. And, and so Overstock Art, it's, you are, could you just give like a, a, a quick overview of, of, of the product and where you're sourcing that from? Because you have a lot of SKUs. I mean, you have what, about yeah. 10,000 different SKUs. So you have a lot of, inventory and that's one of yeah. the things that we're going to talk yeah. about is yeah. is communicator based so how does overstock art work in, in terms of the supply chain and you talked about the framing and could um could you give an overview on that please yeah yeah certainly we have a, a variety of products all our products are decor related or art related mostly handcrafted or handmade our main product line, our hand painted oil paintings, they are uh, created in studios overseas. We work directly with the studios. The supply time of a painting from an order to actual supply is usually between 60 and 90 days. So because we have such a large variety, we can't order a lot of depth. And so that's that's a functional issue for the business. We do all of our own framings, so we order all the frames. Some, depending on how we order, some take a really long time. Some are two weeks away, so that, that's mm-hmm. kind of the variety. We hold everything in stock, so when when a customer orders, we are able to ship in one or two days, so they get the product very quickly. That's very important, and that is something that's tough for our competition to replicate, so we want to make sure we keep track of that. We sell directly through our own website, and we sell through other retailers and marketplaces, but everything is online, and all orders are fulfilled from our facility in Wichita, Kansas, where we do uh, not just pick and pack, obviously. We we take the, the art, and then we, we build the frames, and we stretch and, and, and package the product and ship it. So that's kind of the operation in a nutshell. Everything uh, ships and all customer service are at overstockart.com at, in Wichita, Kansas. And um, I think I'm covering everything, but maybe I'm missing something. I mean, Ty? No, yeah. We The big thing is that we hold stock. Everything, what you see is what you get. We have, so you have the ability to custom frame and that hold so we hold saws and underpinners and we chop and join frames all day. And we have channel zero, which is our website, and then we have yeah. shared re- partner retailers that we work with. Um and we also have a B2B arm as well where we do hotels and things like that. Yeah. Interesting. And and so are you 
shipping internationally or are you just in North, North America? What, what is, what, where is, where's your we, client base? We do sell internationally, but the vast majority is staying in the United States. Yeah. Uh, that's because shipping costs going to Europe or anywhere outside of North America is very high. Canada is reasonable, but it's also not inexpensive. What happens with the carriers is they measure weight in volume or actual weight. And art is, is light, but it's very big. And yeah. so it becomes very heavy. And so yeah. it's expensive. I'm going to tell you, when we spoke earlier, you, you had a quote that really jumped out at me, which was, it's all about value creation when we were talking about the theory of constraints and that you wanted to work in small batches. You wanted the ability to be able to work in small batches without killing yourself. And so you developed this system where you're continually building models for each SKU, like demand mm -hmm. models, mm -hmm. and then you're automating the process of supply. These are the result of that kind of methodology or that strategy that you have has been reduced inventory levels while remaining profitable. And that's a key thing that the cash that's tied up in inventory for any e-commerce brand is significant, unless you're doing drop shipping or something like that. But for your model, the ability to reduce your inventory my understanding was it really increased your profitability and allowed you to be a lot more nimble. Could you talk about that whole kind of transition from maintaining high inventory levels to managing it much more efficiently? Yeah. So basically, because we hold stock, and if you're a retailer that holds stock, you know that it's a nightmare. I mean, just managing that, if you have a ton of SKUs, just working as far as, you know, the buying process and just making decisions and things like that. We were at that point back in the day that we had a bunch of suppliers that we need to, and we need to hold stock for our products. So your painting will arrive in three days. So we'll make the holidays and things like that, which are our biggest days. We have to hold stock in these situations. Many retailers do. So in our case, the big issue was actually communications like communicating with the vendor in a way that's going to be outside of the realm of emails and Excel sheets. Because you'd be surprised how many big retailers, even $100 million retailers, are still doing buying in a seasonal manner and just holding a ton of stock throughout the season and hoping that levels, you know, and, and working based on levels. Uh, for us, we couldn't have that luxury. We had a ton of dollars sitting in inventory, and we wanted to release those dollars. So what we started doing is we started looking at the data flowing from our billing, essentially. So we looked at daily sales of each and every SKU, and we put that daily into an, a database. Mm -hmm. And so daily and slowly what happens, you start getting a model of sales per SKU for each day. You take another file and the other file shows me quantity of each SKU. So if let's say a SKU is selling, then there's the quantity ticker is gonna go down. If something goes back, it's coming into the warehouse. So the numbers there keep moving. So we started building models of quantity in, on hand and sales per day. And then we were able to basically, using a little bit of Bayes' law, as well, using basically not a lot of information, it allowed us to kind of build a model with a certain degree of confidence and taking into account production time and seasonality and all sorts of things like that. We were able to build a model to predict how many we actually need. And when we run these things now, today, we're able to, in a click of a button, know what we need to order from each and every supplier in a certain degree of confidence, and that's color coded, so we can in 10 minutes go through each supplier and we can order in smart and small batches. And why is that important? Because when we do air shipments and everything comes in fast, but it, uh, but we do uh, these shipments um, every uh, week or so and we keep these shipments low. And what happens if you're, for instance, if you're a retailer, if you're buying quantity, 15 in $15,000 quantity every three weeks or $5,000 quantity every week, 
you're essentially spending the same money, but your inventory levels are staying very, very low all the mm-hmm. time. You can spread those dollars and you can spread that dollar. And those, again, come back to the theory of constraint methodologies of reducing inventory and in, in keeping availability high and keeping throughput high. So that's where the fear of constraints kind of comes into the com- communicator base. That's how we call this uh, this tool that we built. And David, if you want to talk about that a little bit more, <laughs> uh, certainly I, I can give an example. When um, this is quite a few years ago, we had um, a person that was doing some of our purchasing, and she was buying frames. And she was ordering in an undisciplined manner, like every once in a while. Mm -hmm. And every order was huge because her goal was to never run out. And I remember looking at that and thinking, that's not right. And so I told her, I'll take over. First thing I did is in this case, because of shipping costs, it made sense to do it every two weeks. I, I communicated with the vendor, and the vendor had minimums. And he said, well, you got to hit this minimum. And I told him, listen, I'm going to hit the minimum over time. If you're unhappy with our purchases over time, we can we can discuss. But you'll give me the same price, and we're just going to order every two weeks. So you know everything is so predictable and so easy for you. It's not one huge order every once in a while. It is every two weeks you get an order from me. He's like, you know what? Okay, sounds good. I'll give you the same price, and if we are not hitting the minimum, then we'll figure it out. Okay. And – that reduced our inventory, and significantly, it's probably what we dropped by about 60%. Increased our availability. It increased by somewhere around 60% because she was constantly running out of stuff. And just streamlined our operation and his operation. Uh, hmm. we, we, were t- we would talk about every couple of weeks because, you know, you work with, with companies and you become friends. And it's like, it's a beautiful thing. We love, it. we know exactly when we're going to get paid. We know exactly, and, and everything just works. And so just taking this idea of how do I optimize, how do I optimize um, my situation while taking care of my vendor? So they're optimized too, is really what this allows you to do. Um, when we looked at, our situation when it comes to art, art, a lot of our art sells only few units a year. But we have to have it in stock in order to be able to fulfill. And we want to fulfill fast because our competitors can't fulfill fast because mm-hmm. they don't know what will sell. And we don't know what will sell either because we don't have a crystal ball. So we built this system, the med planning, which Amitai built. Um, I helped him with the logic, and it is based on Bayes' theorem, and it is it is based on theory of constraints of being able to refill bins. And we don't know what we're going to sell, but we know what size, of, what dynamic size bin we we need to have, and that's how we fill it. And it and it it works fast, so we are able to order once a week if we need to, and it also keeps us at minimum needed inventory, but not below that. And so then we are able to fulfill regularly. We run out of stock, especially on slow movers from time to time, just like anybody mm-hmm. else would. However, we are able to keep core products in stock as needed and fulfill fast while our inventory dropped by a lot. I, I don't want to say a percent because I don't remember, but re- significant drops. And when you drop your inventory significant and increase your availability, you're increasing uh, profitability and increasing cash, which allows you to invest in other things, which will increase your sales by more. And that's why it's so important. And it's great from a customer service standpoint as well, because you're able to fulfill and you do that with confidence. Absolutely. In terms of inventory level management, two words come to mind that you're able to manage those inventory levels faster and better. And without thinking about it necessarily, because your system is doing it for you intuitively, does it not reduce the need to have a buyer as well to, that, that's you know, making these decisions? Is that just then automated essentially? Maybe there's some human oversight, but it's not nearly at the level that, that it perhaps used to be. Is that a correct assumption? Uh, so I, I would say it like this. 
when we started, it was so hard to order that we would only order when we had to because yeah. we have such huge variety. And because it's slow, a lot of it is slow moving, you build these models in Excel and you're trying to guess and you and, and, and you would sit for such a long time and, until you're like, okay, I'm just going to send it out. <laughs> yeah. and, and so now it's thought through, it's fast, it's easy. And yes, you're right. It reduces the need to have a true buy. You still have to negotiate prices, especially at the beginning. You have to oversee that things are going correctly. So you still need to have people involved. However, yes, a lot of the – we streamlined the process, which made it a lot easier, absolutely. And in terms of training that model, how long did that take with your business to get it to a point as you were feeding that data in on a daily basis for you to achieve that level of confidence that you felt comfortable with? In general, we were able to see, because we started this off, we were able to see after a year, we we're able to see a model, a complete model that's taken into account the different uh, data that we're looking because we're because we're feeding in 365 rolling data, mm-hmm. so we feeding that. So approximately after a year, you should have a model that's going to be with a certain degree of confidence would be good. When we're running it now with the new retailer, then we're feeding in old orders. So we're mm-hmm. starting. We can start the process much earlier, but we can start uh, you know feeding in the data, creating the the products on the system. And and um, in some cases, we're able to feed historical data so we can kind of, uh, you know, fill in the, the kind of give it a benchmark at the beginning kind of thing. Because that's the so thing what, is that, what happens oh, is sorry. with the, sorry, the, the supply time of an item, the fluctuation in that, because uh, we start out with an average number, um and then, and then we have to calculate it, and then you calculate averages. And so, the more you do it, the more accurate it becomes. Yeah. Uh, but it works from the beginning in a fairly accurate way. So it, it, it is. It, it was solid pretty quick. And you you developed this for your own business, and then my understanding is you said, "Hey, this is working so great for us. Why don't we Why don't we create a, a, a product and roll it out via a SaaS model?" Um, when did that, uh, when did, and that's, and that's known as communicator base. Yeah. yeah. That's known as a communicator base. We started that, um, right as the pandemic hit. So uh, we started, uh, doing that. We started with an apparel brand at first. Um, and yeah, so we've, we've been building this now for about three years. Um, the system itself has been built for 10 years now. So, I mean, it's been kind of, the blueprint has been, been has been going on for for ten years, uh, but communicator base of what we rolled out has been um, it's been around for about three years. Uh, we're completely bootstrapped. We're still uh, you know doing everything uh, ourselves, but uh, but yeah, it's been a really great kind of you know itch that we were able to find a really nice solution for, um, and just. Using the, that business, the business data that we've been able to, to, uh, to acquire throughout the years to really create a product for, for retailers that hold a lot of SKUs, um, to be able to just hook it up to their, uh, billing, may it be QuickBooks or, or another, and then start seeing data, uh, on their, and, and hooking up their vendors. And then we're starting to see uh, orders flow back and forth. And then, you know, you're kind of hooked. It's very, very sticky because you start working with these orders and you, you get used to it. Um, and then it just, yeah, it just works. So that's what's nice about it. Yeah. And and is there is there a, if you were to look at a, a certain number of SKUs where it makes sense for a given client of yours to adopt communicator base is is there a, a kind of a benchmark that you look at where there's a tipping point in one way yeah. that says hey it really makes sense yeah so i mean because even if you have a low amount of skews you still have variety let's say sizes and colors and things like that but taking into account all of those kinds of if you're over 600 skews even with colors and sizes and things like that 
then definitely you need some sort of tool to th- – this sort of tool will help you manage your uh, buying woes and, and be able to start working in a way th- that's m- much more advanced than than the regular tools that give you certain uh, points that you're, uh, you're going to buy from. So I'd say about 600, 500, 600 SKUs over, then you should probably look for a solution. And my my understanding of this as well is that it also, it's embedded in the name, communicator base. It also enables communication between a company and its vendors, which creates efficiencies. And is that correct as well? Because that's the way it started, wasn't it? Was it like a communication platform? Yeah. Exactly. That's what it is. It's um, just that communication, taking things away that everything is very transparent between you and the vendor. That's so helpful. And it also makes you work, work right. You know, you need your billing to be up to date. You need to put in those GLs, you know, in your, in your accounting. And, and that goes to a book, uh, Managing by the Numbers. Uh, if you're, David uh, knows that book as well. I mean, you, what is your KPIs? What are the things that you're tracking? And, uh, you know, it all comes down today to profitability. And you want to make sure that you're making money and mm. uh, and cash and your cash position. So keeping things like that, it makes you really work transparently all across the organization. Yeah, because there's other more valuable things to do in your business than just manage inventory, I guess, would be a, a, a fair statement. Yeah. And, and what would you say – like kind of like an average in terms of retailers, how much of their of their cash is just sitting there in inventory? Like, is there a percentage? From from what I've heard, over sixty percent of cash just sits in inventory for retailers on average. I mean, it's that's massive. It's, yeah, yeah, it's it's an insane amount of cash is sitting there instead of it working for you in other areas. Yeah. So, and and that would be if we're thinking if we're talking about the theory of constraints. We're talking about inventory, and that's money that's currently inside the system. Money so the if system. you can repurpose that that money so that it's being directed towards something else that's that's building the business, is that uh, the the correct logic on the on on leveraging the theory of constraints as as it relates to your inventory and the inventory management? So um, money that sits in inventory. I'll give you an example. We had, I had a lady that used to do our buying of art for us and she started taking over the role and we gave her the communicator based system and I see that inventory is growing. So I came to her and I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, well, I'm just buying based on what the system tells me. I'm like, okay, can we look together? Sure. And so she's telling me here it tells me to buy two, but I'm buying five. I'm like, okay, why? And she said, well, this product is right now in an event with a retailer, and I know we're going to sell it, so I'm going to bring a little extra. I think, okay, so you're not using the system, right? Well, not in this case. Okay. So I told her, but now we're going to have too much inventory because only about 20% of items on event actually end up selling. And she said, well, if we have a little extra, that's okay. These don't go bad. I'm like, well, but if I don't have cash to pay your salary, is it okay if I'll give you those three extra paintings instead? <laughs> like, well, no, not really. Yeah. I said, okay. So it's not okay for a business either. So we need to order what the system tells us, and then inventory will not grow. And we'll adjust the system if we start seeing shortages. And because and a lot of times – People think, well, it's sitting there. It will be converted to cash. That is true. But when is really important? Because some items will not convert fast enough. And so if you have that extra cash, it could be invested in marketing. It could be invested in people. It could be invested in in solutions. And that's what you want to accomplish. And the communicator base um, used correctly will generate the cash that it costs to implement it pretty easily. And that's the whole idea is that mm. we're helping them actually generate cash with it. And the communication piece, it depends on the business you're in, but in our world where things do take a long time, uh, it's important that we have all of our communications sitting at the PO level or the SKU level where we can see this is when you got it. This is when we had this note. This is when we had this note or this note or that note. And everybody can see it. You, the vendor, and every employee, even a customer service person, if they need to 
to see who the vendor was that created this, or they could see it. It's all there for everybody in the organization, and that's really helpful. Compared to something hiding in a handwritten note on somebody's desk or even in just their email, and they're not trying to hide it. It's just being mm-hmm. hidden because nobody else has access to it. Those are some of the strength of the system. Yeah, it's interesting. What, what I'm thinking is that uh, this is so dialed into what Dr. Gold, Goldratt was all about, was taking that theory and implementing it into a business. And I think about how many people must have read the goal, but don't. Well, first of all, so many, so few people actually really know about it. We were talking about that, Amitai. Mm-hmm. Uh, but how many people actually take that, that, that truth and do something with it. And I think you guys are really unique in, in that, that you've taken it to heart and you've just embedded that into the fabric of your company. You've created another company as a result of that. It, it's really quite impressive. How does somebody get engaged with you with Communicator Base? How does that relationship start? I think that would be helpful for the listeners to understand. I know that you have the website, which is communicatorbase.com. And how does that initial kind of onboarding, what does that look like? If you could describe that, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Initial onboarding with us is we would take your order files. Usually companies have a standard order file they use with their vendors. We would take that order file and we would uh, start loading orders into the system, building products and building past orders into the system immediately. Hmm. Then we would invite the vendors. Um, So vendors would have their own access to a portal where they see orders and shipments of their own orders and shipments. Of course, there is certain information that they don't see. And then the collaboration can start. And then you start building the orders on the communicator base based on the products that you've ordered in the past, of course. And the last step is the demand planning. We hook your billing and your inventory, basically two data streams, the sales data and the quantity data. And the model starts building, and then you start getting recommendations, and you start getting uh, demand planning data, and you can start using the, the AI here and a machine learning that's learning uh, the data, not AI, but machine learning that's learning uh, the data, and it starts taking into account how long did it take until it arrived in your warehouse, everything like that. So we start compounding the days and giving an accurate assumption as how many exactly do you need at any given time for every SKU. Interesting. And, and how long is that onboarding process? Well, it really depends on the client. Sometimes it can be pretty rough. Yeah. Uh, it's always hard to, because um, you really kind of need to, it's something in the heart of the business, but we've had situations where, and we're getting better at it. Right now we can see a process of that can can be probably between three months to to a month that you can uh, get completely onboarded. Oh, that's great. That's quick for something that's going to transform your business for the better. (laughs) You have different pricing plans that people can look at on the website. Is there anything that you wanted to talk about on that or just direct people to the website? All of our clients right now are all in a custom model, essentially, uh, where we build it with them, uh, cater to their needs. Um, So we would love to, if you have a need, if you're a retailer that needs help with their buying process, and we can definitely have a meeting and um, and see if it's something that can be a good fit. We haven't really been able to go after the small businesses that don't have a lot to spend, but we are conscious that they also have the same niche. We haven't been able to solve this, and this is something that we hope to solve this year, to create a true fast option for smaller retailers under $20 million or so. And, and people can go onto the site and schedule a demo, and then you'll walk them through the whole process? Yeah, yeah, we can schedule a demo or they can contact me directly. I can call me on LinkedIn um, or or via email at amitai at communicatorbase.com. Excellent. Be, be, before I move on, is there anything else that you wanted to say about Communicator Base that I didn't ask you that I should have? No, no unless David has something he wants to say. No, no, I think you covered well. <laughs> and if we go back over to the theory of constraints, We've spoken about leveraging the theory, implementing the theory across across your website for optimization, using it for inventory management. Clearly, your your production facilities, 
are there other areas that of your business that that you've successfully um, embedded that 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 practice? I mean, it's I, I'm guessing it's throughout your entire business, but if there are other areas that that you think would or that you'd like to, to talk about, I'd love to hear about them. I think when we look at the theory of constraint, for me, it, it's the thinking processes that you would use. If you use the exact thinking processes that were discussed in in the goal, they don't exactly get into it. There is other books that get into the more details. They're um, a little bit uh, taxing. Like they're hard to do. They're mentally difficult. But you can come up with some amazing solutions um, when you do that. But even even outside of that is just the way we look at situations, um, even small things. And I can't think of a specific example right off the bat, but even small things, if you just look at the situation and say, what is the constraint in this flow? What is the constraint in this situation? And how can we concentrate our efforts towards that? In many cases, you would find interesting ways of, of coming up with solutions. And that has been just an area that has worked for us well. Solving it, it's even sometimes you look at a situation and you're like, oh, this is a simply a problem between two people and right. but you find it because you look at at the situation was what's my constraint here they just they're just not they're not talking yeah that's the constraint if they just get off the chair and go to and just say hey this you know then it's solved and so sometimes just by looking at the situation and just trying to break it down what is my constraint you solve the problem without even having to draw anything or really – and that's really has been a huge thing for us, just being able to solve problems relatively easily that way. Yeah, it's kind of like a filter that you're applying to different yeah, – Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something comes along, apply the theory, where's the constraint? I mean, it's yeah. kind of a simple question yeah. to ask. Exactly. And, and we spoke about – and you, you just touched on it as well about with people. I mean, with people, it could it doesn't have to be a mechanical process. It can be – communication between two humans or lack thereof yeah. like where is that constraint yeah. is it the, is it the yeah. personality where that's bringing the whole team down or sometimes less is more or addition by subtraction that's the constraint right i mean that's yeah. ultimately that's what it's all about i can think yeah. of a lot of constraints in my life that i wish i had applied that filter to i don't know about you yeah. guys but it's a great life lesson thank you very much guys i really appreciate you uh being Yes, participating on the podcast. I think it was a, just a wonderful episode. We learned all about Overstock Art, how that was started. We learned about communicator base. We talked about the theory of constraints. I trust if any anybody's listening to this episode that they've got a ton of value out of it. I certainly did. I really appreciate your time and look forward to uh, speaking with you further as we move forward. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank yeah. you so much, Scott. It's yeah. been such a pleasure to be honor to be on your podcast and uh yeah we love geeking out on toc yeah. uh, so anytime anytime we'd be uh, happy to talk with you about anything absolutely <laughs> thanks very much thank you scott we appreciate it thank you